Hello, my name is Lars Jorgensen. I'm with Thorcon. We just did a conference for Advanced Nuclear in Bali, and this is an extended version of what we presented there. What you see here is two 500 megawatt power plants put into the shape of a ship, a large ship, and it includes everything for the power plant all the way through the electrical switch yard and hooks directly to the transmission lines. This chart shows you all these little circles are coal plants, either operating or under construction or permitted and getting ready to build. As in the case for China and India, uh, a developing nation, as soon as it can afford power, is going to buy the least expensive power, which in today's world is coal. So there's a lot of plans to expand with coal. Our goal is to give the odd nations another choice where we can have supply nuclear power at a price directly competitive with coal. That is uh, good in Indonesia in that nuclear power is reasonably well accepted. As you can see here in this chart, up to 77% uh, pro-nuclear attitudes. So we are optimistic we're going to be able to expand in Indonesia. Indonesia is the world's fourth largest country by population and it needs a lot of new electricity, so there's a, a lot of growth potential here. This shows you a coal plant with a day's worth of fuel for the coal. Um, it needs 10,000 tons, 10,000 tons of fuel a day, and it generates about 1,000 tons of waste a day. You compare that to a nuclear power plant, um, and we need about 0.1 tons of fuel a day and generate the same amount of waste. So we need a lot less fuel, a lot less mining, and you generate a lot less waste. We'll talk more about the waste later. This compares, these two drawings are to scale. Um, once you get past and have generated the steam, converting the steam to electricity is the same. We're basically the same steam conditions as a coal plant that was done deliberately. There are a lot of companies that supply turbine generators for coal plants, so the price competition there is pretty uh, aggressive, and that helps us hold the cost down. But the other half of the plant is taking the fuel and turning it into steam. For These drawings are done to scale, so because you've got so much material to handle, the coal plant is quite large, much larger than our nuclear island. And that leads to uh, lower uh, capex and a, a lower fuel costs. So we believe that we should be able to compete directly with coal. Uh, how do we do this? It's based on a process developed at, in the US at Oak Ridge National Labs. This was done by the same man who was key in developing the light water reactor, but he felt that we could do a better job, and so what he built was a reactor based on molten salt rather than water. A light water reactor uses water as its primary coolant, which means that it's, it wants to turn to steam. Now, if you get over 100 degrees C at one atmosphere, your water will turn to steam. But 100 degrees C is not hot enough to generate power, really. So they get it up to 300 degrees C, but to keep it liquid, they have to put it under 160 bar pressure, 160 atmospheres of pressure to squeeze it in, which means you need thick pipes. If anything goes wrong, that steam wants out. It's going to expand and, and deliver a pressure wave to whatever vessels are containing it. It makes the engineering very much more difficult. In our case, we're using salt as our uh, primary coolant. The salt, if you heat it up enough, 500 degrees C or so, it will melt and become a liquid very much like water. Uh, but it won't boil until 1400 degrees C. We operate between 565 and 704, so we have about 700 degrees of margin before we boil. In other words, we will always be a liquid. We will never turn to a vapor. So if there's any kind of problem, there's no big pressure. You don't get the big expansion of when you normally change from liquid to vapor, so we're not going to do that. 
And if there is any kind of leak, it's going to just spill on the floor like if you had a water leak. Uh, Oak Ridge did this, and they actually built uh, an 8 megawatt thermal uh, reactor core uh, to test out and do the prototyping experiments that are needed for the initial one. When they had finished that and learned everything they could, they developed plans for what to do next. They had several different uh, proposals. The most conservative one was the molten salt demonstration reactor, which was basically just a scale up of the molten salt experiment reactor that, uh, that they already did. Um, that one was to be 350 megawatts electric, um, not to be a breeder, just to consume fuel and uh, to be a single fluid reactor. We've taken that same idea and that's what we're marching forward with is to do it as simple as possible to get to the market as quickly as we can. Um, and our main focus is, of course, safety, but keep the cost down. When we've done that, we've uh, had a lot of time has passed. This was done in the uh, mid-60s to early 70s. Uh, so computers are a lot more powerful now. We have a lot more software, so we can use that to improve the design. Uh, we have uh, um, some more materials to choose from and we're going to shift the production to be more of a shipyard production and we'll show you why that is in a little bit. Where does thoracon come from? It's a thorium converter. So in the nuclear world you can have plants that generate their own fuel. So they will take a common material like thorium or uh, uranium-238 and convert it to fissile and then burn it and generate enough fuel to keep themselves, uh, to supply their own fuel. That kind of a reactor is known as a breeder um, and it's something that the world has been trying to do for quite some time. Uh, the US tried and gave up, France tried and gave up, Japan tried and gave up. Um, the Russians have managed to get a couple going, um, but it's hard. It's quite difficult to get a breeder to really work. So we're satisfied with a converter. So it means that we have to keep adding fuel. We have to buy enriched uranium and keep adding it. Um, our primary concern is cost. And so we need to be sure that we add a small enough amount that the costs stay in line. But we're not really worried about becoming a breeder. In 50, 100 years, that is a problem that does need to be solved, but it's not a problem that needs to be solved today. So the process is uranium-235 will fit it fission by itself, so that's what we have to buy. But we can also have thorium-232, and when it gets a, a neutron, it will become 233, which through a couple of decay steps will become uranium-233, and that's also fissile. Um, and there's a similar process with uranium-238. If you add a neutron, it becomes 239, and then a couple of decays, it becomes plutonium-239, which is fissile. So there's three ways that we get fissiles in our pro process. Um, the thorium, it's about, the core is about 85% thorium and 15% uranium. So we get about 25% uh, of our fission comes from uh, uranium-233 that we got from the thorium and about 25% comes from different flavors of plutonium that we've generated. So we generate about half of our own fuel and we have to buy about half. Over time I can see a number of R&D projects we could have to increase that to, to require buying less fuel but the key emphasis now is make choices of what we're sure of that don't require R&D so that we can get the, get the plant built as soon as we can. Um, one other advantage of using thorium is that thorium and plutonium are chemically similar and it's considered beyond the skill range of terrorists to be able to separate the two. So by having thorium in there we make it so that the concern over terrorist ship stealing stuff and, and doing work with it is alleviated, at least as far as the U.S. is concerned. Okay, this is a picture of the full power plant. It's built in the shape of a hull. You'll find out more later as to why we did that. But we have 
Over here we have the fish and island, this little strip here. Then on this side of it we've got the decay heat removal process. Uh, that's a very important property for your nuclear power plants. We'll talk to that later. And then a few heat exchangers before we get to the, the main turbine and then the generator. In front of the turbine you see uh, these uh, first these green um, feed water heaters. So these are the low pressure feed water heaters, the deaerator, and then the high pressure feed water heaters. So the way the turbine works, you've got to heat up the water before you put it into the um, into the steam generator. And that's the steam generator there. Once you get through this whole section, you've got now electricity at 25 kilovolts, but also about 25 kiloamps. Um, in order to put that on a transmission line, you need to step it up, typically to 275 kilovolts or uh, perhaps even 500 kilovolts, and the current will step down proportionately. So that's what these transformers are. We have uh, three transformers for three-phase grid, and we store a fourth transformer as a spare because the transformers are probably the most likely component to uh, break. And we don't want the delay. If, if a transformer goes out and needs to be replaced, we want to be able to do that very quickly right on site. And then you have the switchyard gear with the circuit breakers and such. And then that goes up. And in this case, it's drawn uh, just like in the model there, assuming that you're going to you're parked right near the shore and you're going to have an overhead transmission line. We also have an option where you can send it out. Uh, in a subsea cable, so if you want to park 5 or 10 or 20 kilometers offshore, that's perfectly feasible. Um, and then you would go uh, with a subsea cable. If you're going to park a long ways offshore, for example, we looked at one site in Europe, which is between London and uh, Belgium, and there we would have to go about 50 to 80 kilometers, and for that we probably want to go to high voltage DC which is something you can also put in as an option into, into the switch gear yard. This is another view of the same thing. Uh, just from the other side here, you can see the big seawater pumps. These don't look so big. They're really uh, about 15 meters tall, so they're not small things. Uh, you can also see here uh, a big pond of water. We use that to remove the decay heat and another pond of water here, which is a backup for that. But as you look at this, you can see that the fission island is a rather small part of the whole job. It includes even a desalination plant, makeup water for the, um, for the turbines, and uh, diesel fuel, there's another diesel fuel tank there. We have our own built-in crane to move stuff around. Everything is accessible by hatches. So there's openings. I don't know if you can see the top of this. You see the, the yellow squares. Those are hatch covers. Because we're at low pressure, we can have very large doors. Those doors are 10 meters by 10 meters and about 500 tons. But the crane can lift them, and then it gives direct access to the, to the components inside the power plant so that we can change out anything that needs to be changed. For example, the steam generator typically will last about 30 years, and so we anticipate that we will have to change it out from time to time, a few times during the life of the plant. We have seen uh, in the US where the light water reactors have concrete, reinforced concrete containment domes, right? But because the pressure can get so high, the door is small, not big enough to take the steam generator out. So when they've had to replace the steam generator, they've had to cut through the concrete to get to the steam generator. They even had one power plant that got lost because when they cut through the concrete, they didn't detention the, the steel cables first, and so the concrete and steel delaminated, and they couldn't repair it. So they lost a power plant that way. For us, it's just a, a door. We lift it. So we have two cans, one that operates and generates power, the other one that has finished his job of generating power and is now in, in cool down mode. So inside the uh, can, 
this, this red thing here inside of there is the moderator. That's graphite. And that will wear out after about four years. So we have to then take the fuel, move it over to the other can, let the fuel cool, let the can cool, that is let the radiation decay away, before we take it out and ship it back for replacing the graphite. You can also see the um, heat exchangers here and the steam generator. Um, and I think that's this is the silo hall region here, right above the reactors. This area, the uh, dose rate is low enough that workers can be there full time. Um, in fact, you probably will get less radiation being inside here than if you were up on top, because you're getting the, the stuff above will block the cosmic rays. Um, and you can see the, the motors are accessible up here, and there's some variable frequency controllers that also control the speed of the motors. All that sort of thing we want to have access to, so we put them up above. All of the uh, fuel, and the spent fuel, is below here, which lets us be both a radiation barrier, but also a safeguards barrier, so that the door that lets you get two of these components down here is about 400 tons and would have uh, IAEA safeguard alarms attached to it. You have no reason to want to uh, open those doors on short notice. So every four years you need to call the IAEA and tell them it's time to refuel, let their inspector have a chance to come, and then open it up, do the refueling, and then close it, and the inspector then reseals it. There's also seals and alarms from underneath, so there's no way to disable them. This is an overhead picture where you can see the different pieces from the nuclear island, the heat exchangers, the steam generator, the turbine. You can see the turbine is a pretty big component, and then the generator, and then the switch yard. Over here you can see the decay heat removal ponds. These are dedicated just for the decay heat. They're not used for the primary uh, heat path. That primary heat path uses once through ocean water cooling. For people who like numbers, this gives you the temperatures and the pressures in the various loops. We have four loops. The primary loop has the fuel salt in it, along with obviously the fuel, but also the fission products will be there. They stay inside the can. The secondary uh, salt here goes into the can, into the primary heat exchanger, then comes out uh, noticeably hotter. It goes in at 454, it comes out at 621, and then goes around to a secondary heat exchanger. The secondary salt is a salt that is compatible with the fuel salt and is always at higher pressure. So if there ever is a leak in the primary heat exchanger, it will leak secondary salt into the primary loop rather than the other way around. That way we keep the radioactivity inside the can. Uh, then the third loop is a nitrate loop. Uh, uses something we call solar salt. It's used in uh, thermal solar plants. And it is very compatible with moisture. It will uh, be compatible if there's a leak in the steam generator. It won't have any noticeable chemical reaction with the uh, uh, solar salt. And also, if you have tritium, which we will get some tritium because we have fission and we have beryllium present, the tritium when it's, can go through hot metal. So it'll go through these heat exchangers, but when it gets to the oxygen that's in the nitrate, it'll get trapped and it'll stay there. Then that goes through a rather standard um, turbine generator. Because we don't have so much material to move, we don't have machinery moving 10,000 tons and scrubbers and all that. Our house load is smaller than a um, coal plant, and we don't lose power out the flue because in a coal plant you have exhaust gases, which you lose about 10% of your energy. We don't have that. So we get efficiencies that are higher than what you'll get in a typical coal plant. Typical coal plant will get about 44% efficiency. And if we're in seawater that's at 30 degrees C, it's pretty warm seawater, we get 46 percent, 46 and a half. And if we're at 20 degrees C, it'll be about 47.7.
So here you get to see a little bit better scale of things. You can see a couple of people here. And uh, this is the secondary heat exchanger and then the um, steam generator. Here we've taken off the can so you can start to see a little bit of what's inside of it. That is the reactor vessel itself there. And uh, steam pipes. Here's the can. This is really where the heart of the action goes on. So you have the reactor vessel, we call it the pot. It's full of graphite, it's about 90% graphite. Uh, graphite serves as a moderator. That makes it so that it slows down the neutrons and it gets us to be critical. So you have a spot here which is nearly spherical in shape, uh, gives us our critical mass. As soon as you leave there, you're in a, a much smaller pipe, you're not critical anymore. So the fission will stop very quickly as, as the salt leaves goes up into this header tank where, where you have a big pump and that pushes the salt around into this uh, blue one which is the uh, primary heat exchanger. So it goes in at 704, the salt comes out at 565. And the secondary salt goes in and out of that same heat exchanger. We're moving the heat from the fuel salt to the secondary salt. One of the nice things about uh, having a uh, liquid fueled reactor is that a lot of the fission products will become either xenon or krypton. They do not have uh, much solubility in the salt at all. They will bubble out. Whether you try or not, they're going to come out. So we go ahead and help them come out and then have a sweet gas of helium to push it along and it will go into these off-gas tanks where the radioactive xenon and krypton can decay away. Um, and after it's decayed for about a week, it'll come out of there and go into additional tanks that we'll talk about later. At the very bottom here, you can see a little gray thing, just barely, <laughs> but that's the freeze valve. Um, so the salt is flowing around in this loop here, but there's a pipe that leads from the very low spot in the um, primary loop. And that pipe uh, ha is, has a section that's been flattened and has cold helium being sprayed on the outside of the pipe so that it keeps that spot of the pipe cold that freezes the salt and makes a plug that keeps that pipe pl plugged. If at any time you cut off the flow of cold helium, that plug will melt and the fuel salt will drain by gravity down into the drain tanks here. The drain tanks are arranged into uh, as tall skinny uh, tanks. There are 32 of them that are spread around in a, in a circle the exact opposite of forming critical mass. We've spread the fuel out as much as we can. It also has a lot of surface area to volume ratio so that there's a lot of surface area to radiate heat from the drain tank into this blue area here, which is our cold wall. So the cold wall is steel and then about a half meter of water and steel. So the heat that's in the fuel will heat up the outsides of, of these drain tanks and then it will radiate across this argon gas filled gap, heat the steel that's on the cold wall which will boil the water that's on the other side of that steel, those bubbles will go up. So the heat will flow naturally from these out and up. We'll talk more about the where it goes from there later. And I think we've got it. There you can see more detail of the freeze valve. This was designed and debugged by uh, Oak Ridge for their MSRE. We just took advantage of all the work they did. We needed four times the throughput, so we just put down four copies. So that's the simple way we approached it. There you can see the flattened part of the uh, freeze valve. Once the uh, bubbles form in, in this cold wall, they will go up, and then they go over to this uh, radiator. Where, which is sitting in that pond of, of, of cold water. That will heat up that water and cause evaporation and will condense the steam that's, in, in, that's gone, up the cold wall, go, gone up the cold wall and that will then be returned to the basement where it will come back in at the bottom. There are no valves in this system. It's always on and there's nothing an operator or prime minister can do to stop it. So, if you ever did have any kind of a problem, 
There are sensors that tell that we're more than 50 degrees above normal. So things aren't right and it cuts off the electricity that drives the helium pumps. That cuts off the helium flow, then the freeze valve will open and the salt will come down into the drain tanks that are hidden by this nice pretty blue thing and then the heat will be pulled out from there. And all of that is something that requires no electricity, requires no machinery, there's no operator action, no maintenance worker can leave a valve in the wrong spot. Because what we've observed is that every one of our nuclear accidents have involved people doing the wrong thing. So we've made it so that if a person does the wrong thing, the reactor will, by physics, shut itself off and remove the decay heat. This cooling pond has enough water in it to last for about five months, at which point the Decay heat has gotten far enough down, we believe that uh, air cooling will suffice from that point. We haven't run those numbers yet, but that's, that's what our plan is. So the, the water in this wall is in a closed loop. It doesn't evaporate. It's the water in the pond that evaporates. The other thing I'd point out is that the, this is open to the atmosphere. Uh, so if you had a fire truck, you could add water to that pond without trouble. And one of the problems they had at Fukushima was they ran out of cooling water, they got a fire truck there, but the pumps in the fire truck were not strong enough to force the water in against the big pressure that was inside that cooling system. In addition to, the, to this passive cooling system, we also have a, a lot of spare basement water. If a terrorist came along with his scuba gear and he welded shut that pipe, then what would happen is there's a blowout panel and the water that goes in here and turns to steam would expand and put pressure on and blow out that panel and then that will go into a quench pipe that's in the basement water here. So then we would be boiling off the water that's in this section and dumping it into this basement. And that will give us about four months of time to respond. In that case though, you are boiling away the water that's part of this cooling system. So you got to get there. But that would be if a terrorist attacked the power plant, and I would expect you'll be there within four hours, not four months. So we think we've got a backup to our passive safety system that should be sufficient. This just gives you a lot of specific numbers about the primary loop. Um, and for the engineers, have fun. <laughs> uh, but I guess I'll point out this is on the order of 7 meters across and about 12 meters tall. And that's providing enough power for a city in California of 250 million people. So, no, I'm sorry, 250,000 people. <laughs> um, so, you get a lot of power out of a relatively small space. We have three shutdown rods. Any one of them can shut down the uh, power plant and stop fission. You can see them here. They're, they're not very large. They're just about this big. Um, so they're triple redundancy there. They operate with a magnetic catch. If you go over temperature, the electricity to the magnetic catch is cut off and the rods will fall by gravity. Takes about two seconds to, to drop, so um, that gives us our fastest uh, mechanical way of shutting down power. The other ways that you shut down power is that um, it has a negative uh, temperature, co negative thermal coefficient of reactivity. I'll get it out. Uh, so that as the salt gets warmer, it will be less reactive. It will shut itself down if you have. If, the, if for some reason all three shutdown rods failed, the reactor would heat up and it would shut down within about 80 seconds, just from getting too hot. Okay, okay. Um, I mentioned that xenon and krypton want to come out. They are about 40% of the fission products. Um, we can grab about 25 to 30% of, uh, of all the fission products by pulling the uh, off gas off. 
So what we have is there's a gas headspace above the header tank, around the tank pump, to let the, the xenon and krypton come out, and then we have a sweep gas at about two liters per minute. The xenon and krypton are generated at about one liter per hour. Those go into these uh, tanks that are still inside the can to let the most uh, intense part of the radioactivity die down before we leave the can. Once it's been died down for about a week, it goes over into these two very large tanks, so that's almost 500 cubic meters worth, uh, where even the longer lived fission products will decay away. So that at the, by the time we get to here, we'll be down to just the tritium and the krypton-85. That will go over to a cold trap, which will separate out the xenon, which at this point is no longer radioactive, put that into bottles, and it will also separate out the krypton and put that into a bottle. And then there's a getter to gather any oxygen or tritium that have leaked into the system. Um, the salt is not corrosive unless you get oxygen or moisture in there. So we continuously remove down to parts per million all the oxygen and moisture. Tritium is generated and some of it will go with the salt, so we'll grab, with the off-gas, so we'll grab that. And then we'll compress it and send it back around. So we have a closed loop for our helium. Um, okay. Inside the can is graphite, it's the moderator. The neutrons that strike the, the carbon atoms will move them out of place. And eventually that makes the graphite swell. So it'll first shrink by 2% and then it'll start swelling. When it gets back to its original size, we say, okay, it's done now and we need to replace it. We don't try to replace it at the, can at the power plant site. Instead, we leave the, primary, leave the graphite inside the pot, which is inside the can. We we'll take the whole can out and we put it into a specially designed ship, which we call the can ship. This is designed per international standards for transport of nuclear materials. And we'll put that into there and this ship will also bring a replacement can. So every four years the ship comes by, it brings in fresh cans, takes out the old cans, it brings in fresh fuel, it takes out the old fuel. And that's what this big sturdy crane is for. That, I should also mention that allows us to do a thorough inspection of all the parts inside the can so that uh, we can replace any other parts that are wearing out. For example, we expect the bearings will have a life of about 16 years, so they'll have to be replaced periodically. Um, there's a filter in there that probably gets replaced every four years. It's just a few things that will need to be replaced regularly. The primary uh, metals generally will not need to be replaced. Okay, then some details on the can ship. Uh, this can be placed, this ship can take shallow draft, so it can go up rivers uh, as well as go through the ocean. Uh, for Indonesia, I think we'll be almost entirely ocean based, but in many other places we need to be able to go up major rivers. So the safety here is intrinsic, that is, it's going to do it automatically without any electricity, people, um, or machinery. So the first one is to stop the fission. We talked about the shutdown rods dropping automatically and that backed up by the salt heating up and losing its reactivity as it gets warmer. So that stops the fission, that's job one. Job two is to remove the decay heat we talked a lot about by having the fuel salt drain into the drain tanks and then radiate their heat into this wall and then into the decay heat removal pond. And the third job is to be sure that we keep all the fission products contained. So the fission products are mostly inside the primary loop, but definitely inside the can, which is inside the silo, which is inside the hull. Let's see, did I get it right? Yeah. So, the can and the drain tank make our first tight fission barrier. Um, the can is 25 millimeters of steel, but it has no pressure. It's the same pressure on the outside as inside. And it doesn't have corrosive gases. It's got helium or argon around it, 
So it's in a very benign environment. It's just, it simply is not stressed. The drain tanks are thinner. They're about 10 millimeters thick. But again, the same thing. And they're very uh, small diameters. So their hoop, hoop stress is small. The can, by the way, is at about 350C. So it's not even very warm. The drain tank does get warm when the salt is put into it. But that doesn't last for a long time. So the accumulated creek damage is small. Outside, once beyond the first barrier, we have a second barrier, which is the steel that's part of the silo wall and the floor that's above it. Um, that's also a gas type barrier. Um, and that is also, you know, it's at 140 degrees C and a few bars pressure. So it's under no stress as far as steel is concerned. And unlike a light water reactor, if there is an accident, and somehow the salt gets through the first barrier, it doesn't push a whole bunch of pressure onto the second barrier because it doesn't vaporize. So we don't have the kind of cascading problems that you often get with light water reactors, where once you have a meltdown, the chances of a release are suddenly much, very high. And the final one is the ship hull itself. So we have three strong barriers. The ship hull is 25 millimeters of steel, and then three meters of concrete, 25 millimeters of steel. So it's a, a very robust um, barrier, and it also serves as the barrier against aircraft strike. So given recent events, well, not quite so recent now, but not long enough that most of us remember it, um, at Fukushima, you say, well, what would happen to this plant if you had something like Fukushima? So where you had a big earthquake, and when an earthquake happens, it sends out two waves. The first wave travels very fast, but doesn't induce much motion. In fact, most people wouldn't notice it. But we have sensors to, to notice it, and they have them at Fukushima. So when that first wave hit, the sensors saw it and dropped the shutdown rods and turned off fission. When the main earthquake hit, the fission had already been stopped. And the plant was in shutdown mode. The plant survived the earthquake just fine. So for the next 45 minutes, it was uh, cooling down and removing the decay heat. But then the tsunami hit. And when the tsunami hit, that took out the cooling system. And then because it wasn't being cooled, you had problems with decay heat and eventually causing the zirconium to uh, release hydrogen and then the hydrogen explosion. For us, if we had that same sort of scenario, the earthquakes would uh, drop the shutdown rods and start a drain. All fission would stop. Then we would lose the primary and cooling you now because we were bored waiting 45 minutes. We only did that for five minutes before we so okay, let's let's assume the earthquake happened closer, and so we lose the primary cooling, but now we're draining, and the maximum salt temperature gets to 750C, which is still below even where you start accumulating any creep damage. You're still within spec for what the stainless steel can tolerate. We could have a worse accident. You could imagine an earthquake so bad it knocked out all of the electricity right away. That's noticeably worse. It's really a big benefit to have that first 45 minutes of cooling. That kind of an accident would take out any light water reactor around. But in our case, we lose the power, therefore the shutdown rods drop. Um, the freeze valve starts to melt. It takes about 10 minutes for the freeze valve to melt. And then the fuel salt drains and it passively cools because once it's in the, in the drain tanks, the cooling is done uh, automatically. In that case, we hit a maximum temperature of 850C and create a very, very slight amount of creep damage. The worst one would be if you had an instant station blackout and you had a triple failure on the shutdown rods. So all shutdown rods fail and you have lost all electricity instantly. In that case, the temperature starts climbing all um, by itself, and um, 
what stops the fission will be when the salt gets to about 800 degrees C because of uh, the temperature climb. So that's about 80 seconds, and then it climbs from there. So at the end of that very bad accident, you, the salt would have gotten to 1,000 degrees C, and we would have suffered creep damage for about half of 1% of the steel life. Obviously, since the shutdown rods didn't work, we would say this can is condemned and replace it. But there was no release, even in this very worst of accidents. Okay. So, um, I told you we designed this like a ship. Uh, when we designed it, we put down the spec that it should survive North Atlantic storms. Uh, North Atlantic storms can give you nine meter tall waves, accelerate your ship by one G. Um, so here you see a, a finite element model of the ship and the blue line that's sort of waving along is the wave. And we did a bunch of different wave patterns. We had to do a little bit of adjustment to add some high strength steel here and there where there was the biggest stress. But we were able to design this to tolerate um, 1G forces. And in the North Atlantic storm, that's going to last for days. In contrast, an earthquake, typical light water reactor is spec to 0.4 Gs, and earthquakes last, a long, big one might last a minute or two. Most of them last a few seconds. So the, the designing it to be able to be towed meant that we've designed it so that it would be able to tolerate quite severe earthquake. We also looked at what happens with an aircraft strike. For the vast majority of the plane, it just crumples. I mean, planes are made deliberately to be as light as possible. So when they hit something solid like what we have, the plane itself will just crumple to dust. But the engine has some sturdy components in it. So what we actually modeled was the engine itself. We had it flying at 200 meters per second, which is a pretty good clip to try to fly when you're down at sea level. Um, that's getting you pretty close to uh, supersonic speeds where the plane will just rip itself apart. What happened was the engine did penetrate the steel on the outside. Then it bumped into all that concrete. It pushed the concrete enough that it uh, dented the inner wall by 300 millimeters, but it didn't penetrate the inner wall. So we were able to survive a aircraft strike, and this was with pretty um, pessimistic uh, presumption. So we, had, we assumed the plane was able to strike us right at 90 degrees at maximum speed, which takes a really good pilot. Um, okay. Next question is how are we going to deal with earthquakes? So we're going to be resting on the seabed. We're not floating, so we will feel a little bit of the earthquake but we'll have a fair amount of sand below us. And if it's not natural sand, then we'll prepare the seabed to put that in. The sand won't transmit strong forces. You know, if, you, if you try to move something hard against the sand, you're gonna slide over the top of it rather than moving the whole sand. So you can have a strong earthquake here at over one G, and the sand will give way so that the hulls only sees about 0.3 Gs. So we should be very comfortable with the horizontal forces uh, of, a, of the sand. We have not completed this analysis. We have to figure out how to accommodate the vertical forces, and that's a bit of a complicated uh, analysis that we probably will have to employ the people that build the offshore platforms to be able to do that analysis. In addition, the, the can is inside it is suspended, suspended with basically shock absorbers so that the can, is, so there's an attenuation between how the hull moves and how the can moves. Another concern we would have to watch out for is tsunamis. We are, after all, at sea level. Um, the hull is 30 meters tall and typically will be in 5 to 10 meters of water. So you'll have 20 or so meters of freeboard. So if, the, if a tsunami comes along and it's less than 20 meters, it's not going to do much. 
uh, depends on where you are. Uh, we would recommend you not put yourself in a specific tsunami zone. Um, to get a large high wave tsunami, you really need a land structure that looks like a lens to focus that tsunami and focus all that energy into a small space. There's relatively few places like that, so most of the places you could choose would have much, much smaller tsunamis as even a potential. Um, if you are in a place that has a larger potential, you can put in heavier uh, ballast. So we tow it, which means it's floating to the site, and then we ballast it down. We add water and cement to make it heavier so it sinks to the bottom. If the tsunami raises the water level, then the ship could float if it gets too much. By using a heavier ballast, you can prevent that, and we can even have, use a heavy enough ballast to keep it on the bottom at all times. Um, that would probably be an extra $100 million of capital cost. It can be done, we're not recommending it. We recommend instead, choose a place that doesn't have 20 meter tsunamis. There aren't very many that have those. Oh, by the way, also don't build on top of a volcano. Yeah. <laughs> no guarantees for that. Okay, a topic that gets discussed a lot is what about the waste? Yes, please. For nuclear power, waste is actually one of our advantages compared to our competitors. It's only when you compare it against perfection that waste is really, that you can try to make that a big problem. This is a picture of the waste from a coal plant. A coal plant generates about 100,000 times more waste than a nuclear plant which means they generate so much waste they can't afford to put it in containers. They make big piles out of it, make lakes out of it. And even in the US, we've had those, when there's a, a heavy rainstorm, we've had that turn into a, a slush and break its dam and go wipe out of town. It's happened more than once. We've never had a problem with uh, nuclear waste. This is all the waste from a light water reactor yeah, you can barely see it. 28 years of 450 megawatts. So, and you can see people standing here. That tells you two things. One, the scale is not large. Two, it's not a radiation area. People can walk up right up to the can to the cans because they have shielding in them. And they're cooled by natural draft circulation. So they're just air cooled. They're basically just sitting there in a parking lot. So that means of storing waste can be done. If you wanted to do that for Indonesia, you could do that. Let's see the next slide. Yeah. Um, for the, the plan is that this is Bataan's responsibility, and they will find an uninhabited island, and that will provide enough storage to let you store all of the waste from all the nuclear power plants if you used only nuclear power for generating your electricity for the next 100 years. So there's no problem storing the waste. We can do that. And that is currently the baseline plan. So the fuel lasts in the plant for 16 years, and then it cools on board for at least four, maybe up to 12 years more before we try to ship it. We put it into a special shipping cask, and we put that on the can ship, and we take it to wherever that storage site is. There's an option where we can add five meters of length to the uh, hull, and then we can store it on, on board. What we would do is we would add five meters between here and here, and be able to pump it and keep, keep the fuel on board. Um, what we've seen in practice in the United States is the government never got around to building the interim storage area. Um, so it's been stored on site. Uh, so, if you want to do that, we can do that as well. We can store inside the hull, just in five meters of space, 80 years worth of operating the plant. That also helps you visualize that this is not a lot of stuff. It fits in five meters out of that 175 meter ship. Why do we build it like ships? Well, because that's what we've done before. This is a picture of the world's largest double-hull oil tanker. Um, our founder designed it, supervised its, biz, uh, its building, and operated it. He built four of those, and the last one took less than a year to build. 
it's about twice the size of one of our power plants. So we have experience, we know how to build this, we know how to design to make it suitable for the yard to build. Um, and that one cost $90 million to build. So we can build our whole power plant in a reasonable cost. We've got an estimate from a shipyard for building about 75% of the cost for $350 million, which is in line with our estimates of about a dollar a watt. Okay. What does the shipyard look like? Well, they, they have panel lines that will divide the design down into blocks that are 300 to 500 tons each. And they'll be worked on in parallel. So you could have 100 different pieces of the power plant being worked on in parallel. When the blocks are all finished, then they are assembled and dry dock into the whole ship. The advantage of that is that if one block has a problem, you can test each block as it's built. So each block when it's finished, we're going to test to be sure that all the connections are there and inspected and such. If any block didn't pass, we can go back and rework that block while the other 99 blocks keep on continuing so that it doesn't interrupt the flow of uh, delivery. That's how the shipyards can sign contracts for firm fixed price, for fixed schedule, and plan on building this in a year. That's in sharp contrast to building light water reactors where a build time of 10 years is pretty common. They get a lot of productivity by working in the shipyard. They've got machinery there and people who are experienced using it. So what you see here is a welding machine Actually, what you see here in this picture is about five welding machines and one person. In the yard, they actually run about 80 machines in parallel and one person operating it. Because you're going to have a flat panel and you're going to put a lot of stiffeners in it. Okay. On this side, you see the shipyard itself. One of these shipyards, the, the Hyundai one, could turn out 20 one gigawatt power plants each year. There's enough surplus capacity in the world to deliver about 200 gigawatts worth of power plants with our design a year. There's a lot of surplus shipbuilding capacity in the world. What that says is we can build these power plants as fast to satisfy the full demand. Whatever people need, we can build them that fast. We don't have a limitation industrially. That's in contrast to a light water reactor where you've got these thick forgings that only a very few people in the world can make. I think there's one in Japan, one in France, and I think one in China. So they're limited in how fast they can build out. But we can build out. So where are we with our program? We're currently in design. Um, we expect it will take about one year from when we get full funding to be able to finish the design, finish specs, get them reviewed by vendors, get the bids in, and be ready to build something. And then about one year to build what we call a pre-fission test platform. I'll talk a lot more about that later. We test that one for a year. Again, it's pre-fission, so there's no fission going on, so it's not intensely radioactive. Once we've debugged a lot of things, then we can go to build the actual demonstration plant. So this would be a 500 megawatt power plant. That would take about a year. And then about two years for testing that plant. At that point, we'll be six years into the program. We expect to do this in conjunction with the regulator, so they will review the test plans, they will be present to witness the tests. So when we finish the tests, they will already have finished their regulatory work. And then we need to write up the last little bit of the last test. So we should be able to get a license very shortly after we finish the last test. And at that point, we can start production. We're expecting that it takes about a year to build and about a year to uh, install it and um, do the, the startup uh, tests that need to be done before we can be on the grid. So roughly two years from the time that you have the order and you have the uh, site license and you have the local building permits before we can be putting power on the grid. So that's, a, that's a nice in that it lets you respond quickly to changes in demand. I mentioned the pre-vision test plant. 
This is a test plant to check out as much as we can before we go radioactive. So it is full scale in terms, it has one power pot plant in it, one, one can, and, but it's full scale and uses electricity for heat since we don't have any fission. So we're anticipating around 10 megawatts of, of heat. We can use that to do things like run the pump, pumps at 120% of full speed and verify that we don't get any vibration in the pipes, that everything is snugged down appropriately with the right kind of shock absorbers. We can uh, heat the salt up hot, make sure that we can run it at, at high temperature. Uh, we can even emulate accidents. So we can, uh, for example, drain the salt and turn the heaters on that are in the drain tanks to mimic the heat that's generated by decay heat and verify that the cold wall will extract that decay heat and send it up to, to the decay heat removal pond. So even before we have built the uh, demonstration plant, we should be able to create a mock-up of a Fukushima accident and verify that this is not going to be an exciting test. It's going to be a boring one. This is a rather large structure. It's about 30 meters cube. You can see scale with the people there. We will end up dumping the excess heat, the 10 megawatts of heat, just to the air. So we're not going to have a turbine generator attached to it. There's really nothing new to learn with that. The cold people do those all the time. OK, any questions? So this plant would be 10 megawatts thermal. 10 megawatts. Yeah. So, uh, that is enough for us to test the salt flowing at mm -hmm. more than full speed. We can test the salt at maximum temperature. We can test full decay heat. Uh, we can test the salt running at full speed with a small delta T. We can run the salt at a low speed with a large delta T. So we can test a lot of things, but we cannot do full speed and large delta T because that would be too much heat transport. And we can't test any of the neutronics. But it will have thorium and uranium in it. It will be the right density, the right chemistry. And we can test the sensors, being able to test the verify the redox and other such things. Ask, uh, what what is the most critical test in the testbed platforms that you think if this test uh, passes that we're all good to go? What is what the most critical test you gonna do, do perform here? I would think that would be the Fukushima type test. Fukushima so you do a, do a sudden drain and you heat, use electric to heat the salt in the drain tanks like the decay heat. If you look at the accidents, both Three Mile Island and Fukushima were accidents that were, the final trigger was the decay heat. They didn't get rid of the decay heat. Right. Now, the question is, of course, uh, if, let's say, government forces you to ask if uh, everything passes in this testbed platforms, right? If you have to say a percentage, how many percent that you would be confident when the final plan built it would be successful? Enough to invest six hundred million dollars. <laughs> <laughs> like ninety percent confident? Uh, yeah, uh, it, it will be successful. The only question is. Uh, if you hit hiccups that delay the schedule. At the end of the day, there's no doubt we're going to be able to do it. The only doubt is if you hit some problems, it, it may take you an extra six months or an extra year, maybe even two years, to work out and work out an alternate solution. But there's really very little risk that you won't be able to do it. So basically, there is no risk of a showstopper that suddenly, hey, we. Uh, we, we designed it wrong and it cannot be built. It's just that that need to be uh, revised or changed or stuff like that. Yeah, otherwise you should fire me. <laughs> no, seriously, uh, seriously, the whole point of the pre-fission platform is to be able to take out those risks, both for the investor but also for the regulator. We need the results from this test when we go before the regulator because they have to sign off that this plant will be safe. They have to be convinced. I think seeing it work is going to be a lot more convincing than seeing our computer printouts. Right now, this is very interesting. The regulator, how would you see this benefit the regulator with the testbed platform? 
A um, couple of ways. Uh, the, they can see the actual decay heat removal system working and measurements of actual physical things, which is a lot more convincing than a simulation that says that it works. Um, two is the basic design. The fact that the safety system is very confined in a small space and is fully passive makes it a lot easier to analyze. You look at the safety system on a light water reactor, you have to have a safety system that can overcome very high pressure and force liquid in there. It has to be able to retain high pressure. There's, the safety system on a light water reactor is a very impressive piece of engineering, but it takes some impressive analysis and re for the regulator to even decide that this one is safe. In our case, because it is fully passive, it is something that is much more clear that it's safe. You know, when you get a very complicated system, then you've got to start thinking, well, what if this, and then this, and then that? You get a lot of combinatorics that can happen. And that's really, when you look at any of the accidents, it hasn't been one thing that's failed. It's been when you get a combination of three or four things that were seemingly independent that things went bad. The, we will be able to use the demonstration platform to demonstrate, measure the time it takes for the shutdown rods to fall. And from the time you cut off electricity until the time they've fallen, we can measure that. We can measure how long it takes to drain. We can measure how well the heat transfer happens from the drain tank. We can overpressure the silo and, and show that it keeps things contained. And likewise for the whole silo hall. We can measure all those things as actual measurements before we build it. Most of the time when you build a new reactor kind, the first of a kind is the full power plant and you're depending, when you got your license, the regulator had to do it based on simulations. In our case, they'll do it based primarily on measurements. The place where there won't be measurements will be on the neutronics. So for the, the it'll be a process step-by-step -step commissioning um, where we get a license but we can't bring it up to full power. We can only bring it up at first subcritical and we make measurements about the neutronics and see that it matches the simulations and then we go to 100 kilowatts and then a megawatt and then 10 megawatts and step by step go through and prove that things are tracking with our predictions the most critical safety thing though will have already been demonstrated that is you can shut it off and drain it and it will remove the heat so you're taking out the big risk already um, in this platform, there will be no fissile. No, so no, it will no. be just thorium and uranium, but not fissile. However, you get to this one, yeah. demonstration yeah. plant, you need that fissile for it to do anything. So yes, you will have to have it in the fuel salt. Um, so we'll have most of the fissile in the fuel salt when we load the fuel salt. But we have something called makeup fuel. So inside the can is a tank of more enriched fuel that we add periodically about eight times a day. We add just a little bit. Um, and so we'll have to add a number, a bunch of that to bring the uh, plant up to initial operating conditions. Most important. <laughs> there are many things that are important. Um, I, I need the, the basis, the measurements that I can use when I talk to the regulator to provide them with the, with the information they need for the safety analysis plan. Um, but even before that, just to be sure all the pipes fit, there isn't something in the way, the pipes don't vibrate. You, know, you design something this large and it's pretty common that you discover that the walls don't line up or some silly things, right? Um, so getting all those bugs worked out uh, early on when we're not in a um, under the microscope of publicity. So the, the pre-vision plant will be not radioactive, so it probably won't gather a lot of public scrutiny. The demonstration plant will probably have a lot of attention, and I'd like that to go very smoothly. So that's a big part of what the pre-vision plant will do. So there, there is an iteration between testing and revising the design in this phase, right? In this phase, yes. yes. So yes. you iterate between testing and redesign, testing and redesign until you get a fixed design, right, which you can go to the engineering company for the uh, fit design, final design. final design. Right. Also, this platform will serve as a test bed for design improvements. Mm -hmm. So once we've built it, 
if you have a better idea for what to do with the can, we can install it here and test it out here before we put it in a real reactor. Likewise for lots of other components. Uh, so it, it becomes a, a long-term test platform for us. I'm going to go over some specifications on the electrical interface that we are planning on. We have yet to negotiate that with the turbine generator vendor and with PLN. So we pulled these from specifications from the EU utilities and from UK, a couple of other sources. Uh, first one would be Black Star. There are two conditions. One would be if the plant was cold, like it would be when we first install a power plant. In that case, we use diesel, which is about a one megawatt electric to preheat the aux boiler and run pumps. Then we use the aux boiler, which is about 50 megawatts thermal to heat up the salts and the piping and the turbine generator and to generate some steam flow through the turbine. Then we use the century turbine to generate, use that steam to generate 15 megawatts electric. That provides house load power so it can start pumping salts and seawater and such around. We can then transition to hot standby or island mode uh, where we would use the, norm, the normal nuclear heat and come down the primary heat transport path to the century turbine. So all of this would be covered by the nuclear side and then we'd pick up with the century turbine. And we can sit in that mode for days, years even. I hope it stays or less. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> um, yeah. And then when you want to ramp up to power up the grid, uh, you have a power factor. You could typically when you first initialize a grid, you're going to have a lot of lagging. So you have a range of uh, power factors that you can tolerate. So it has to provide at least 100 megavolt amps reactive during the initial en energizing the grid. Um, except the loads in 50 megawatt uh, blocks. During this time, voltage won't be controlled as precisely as in normal operations. So the spec is within 10%. Frequency varies more than normal, 47 to 52. We have to be sure that our control system understands that you are bringing up the grid so that we widen the window of what is acceptable behavior. And then more technical details of uh, how, how you bring up the, the, the grid. Finally, uh, there's a lot of stored rotating energy in, in the, the turbine as opposed to the windmills or solars that won't have that kind of energy available. In normal operation, um, we're specking right now 60 year design life or 200 starts. I want to push that up to 80 year design life. I think there should be no problem with that. A four year overhaul for the uh, turbines. So typical is three, we're pushing a little further so it coincides with when we're changing the cans. A ramp rate of at least 5% per minute from 50% to 100% power. We can talk to the, the, the vendors and find out if they can ramp faster. But that should be enough to, to be load following. If you're less than 50% power, then the ramp rate is slower because it's actually proportional to the power that's being put out. So it's spec at 3% per minute between 30% power and 50% power. We already talked about the power factor uh, and about tolerating uh, a wider range of uh, line frequencies than what's normal operations. And then we have automatic voltage control so that if you want us to be the primary frequency control or a secondary voltage control, we can play those roles. I would expect for the demonstration plant, our focus will be on initially being base load and once that is well in hand, then we'll, we'll move on to, to being able to do more load following. But this becomes very important when you start penetrating the grid to be 70 or 80 percent of the grid's power. It's not very important initially when you're a small fraction of the grid's power. And that's, that's it. it. Very good.